Hello! So, what we're going to look at to start with is a little bit of revision. We're going to look at forces and stresses on a fluid element. So, we need to remember what we've learned about this before. So, what we're going to do is we're going to look at which stresses act on which faces, and we'll look at how we record that stress information in terms of a tensorial format. We'll revise a bit of sign definition. We need to know what stresses are positive and what stresses are negative. We'll also look at the condition that leads us to a very important property of the stress tensor, which is that of symmetry. This implies a rotational equilibrium within the fluid element. And symmetry is an important property that we must obey not only with the stress tensor, but with other tensors that give rise to the stress tensor. And so remembering this important point is something that will stand us in good stead as we go on. So let's have a look now at an elemental cube of fluid. On the blackboard in front of you, you'll see such a thing. Now remember, this elemental cube of fluid is really, really small. And so this infinitesimally small fluid is, in this assumption, governed by a Cartesian coordinate system. It could be any coordinate system, it doesn't matter, but Cartesian is just easy to explain. So you can see that this imaginary infinitesimal small cube of fluid has x faces, y faces, and z faces. Now, if we were to imagine a force acting on this block of fluid, it could act arbitrarily in any direction. However, we can decompose that force into a force in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. However, we also need to know which face that force acts on. And so illustrated, what we have is a force on the x direction face. We can see that that x direction face force will resolve into three forces in the x, y, and z direction, all acting on that x face. So when we record this information, we need to record two pieces of information. We need to record the face upon which the force is acting, in this case the x face, but we also need to record the way in which the force is acting. And so we have two subscripts. And in the green box there on the blackboard, you can see that our first subscript is I, which is the face name, and the second subscript is J, which is the direction of the force upon which it acts on that face. The easy way to remember this subscript notation is it's face first when it comes to this subscript. So I is first, so therefore it's a face. So F I J, I is a face name, and J is the direction that the force acts in. OK, so now let's talk about stresses. We don't really talk about forces when we think about a fluid element so much, but we do talk a lot about stresses. And so what I've done now is to replace that arbitrary force acting in a direction with an arbitrary stress. The stress is designated tau, and the components into which it decomposes have two subscripts, face first, then direction of force. So tau x, y acts on the x face in the y direction. Likewise, tau x, x acts on the x face in the x direction. So what we have is a set of information, and we need to record that set of information in an easy way that can be manipulated mathematically. So here we have the stress tensor. Tau, in bold, non-italic lettering, is the tensor form. And you can see, in this case, it's a 3 by 3 matrix, because we're considering three coordinate directions. And we have tau xx, tau xy, and tau xz in the first row. So though all those are forces acting on the x face. So let's look at the structure of this tensor in a little more detail. Here we have it the stress tensor. Nine elements, and we can gain a lot of information just by looking at which elements are zero and non-zero. Now, recall that the change of face upon which the stress acts is the first letter, face first. So as we go down in rows, we'll go from x face to y face to z face. 
The second subscript is the direction of the stress. So as we go across the columns, we have the X direction, the Y direction, and the Z direction. Now, when the stress tensor is structured in this manner, we can see that the pattern of the tensor tells us information about what stresses are being exerted. So for example, if we have a look at the diagonal, tau xx, tau yy, and tau zz, we have the normal stresses. You might be used to hearing these called principal stresses, but in the case of rheology, we talk a lot about the difference between normal stresses. Hence, we call them normal stresses. So xx, yy, and zz, there on that principal diagonal, are normal stresses. Stresses that do not lie on the principal diagonal are shear stresses. And we can see these on tor xy, tor xz, and tor yz in the upper triangular section of that matrix. And in the lower triangular section, we have tor yx, tor zy, and tor zx. So there are our nine stresses in our stress tensor. Now, if we're going to do calculations with a stress tensor, or even if we just use a stress tensor to get information in a mental model, we need to know which stresses are positive and which stresses are negative. And so, of course, there is a convention for this. Now, on the blackboard, I've put a projection of one face. This is the yx face, so normal to this would be in the z direction. So we're just looking at a slice across that elemental cube of fluid. Now, let's think about our normal stresses. The definition is that normal stresses acting in the direction of the face, or in this case, edge, normal, are positive. And so there we are, we have positive stresses acting outwards, in effect, putting this elemental fluid element in tension. Let's think about shear stresses. The shear stresses I've illustrated now are again all positive. Now note the direction of these because this does become important later on. So there we go. There are the positive stresses for an elemental face of fluid. And of course that concept extrapolates to that elemental cube. Okay, now we've got nine stresses in our stress tense, which is a lot of information to deal with. And we mentioned right at the outset that an important point of the stress tensor is symmetry. And so let's have a look at the condition that must be obeyed for that tensor to become symmetric. So here we have that yx face again, remembering that the normal will be in the z direction. And let's say that these shear stresses here are out of balance. Those out of balance stresses will cause a moment of rotation. Now, if we've made an assumption that the fluid element is in rotational equilibrium, that can't be so. So in that case, these shear stresses have to balance. Otherwise, there'd be a residual moment, which we've assumed is not there. So let's look at our stress tensor again. There are our nine elements, tau xx, tau xy, tau xz, and so forth. And if we're saying that there's no rotational motion of this fluid element at equilibrium, we can see that the x, y, and the y, x shear stress have to balance. And so there in yellow, in that second tensor, I've put them both to be the same as tor x, y. Likewise, the x, z, and the z, x shear stress will also have to balance. They're there in pink. The y, z, and the z, y shear stresses also have to balance to avoid this rotation, and they're there in white. And so when we have equilibrium that does not involve rotation, we have a symmetric stress tensor with only six independent stresses, because we have the equality of those shear stresses either side of the principal diagonal, which is what gives us that symmetry. So let's recap some key points. If we think of a fundamental fluid element, there are nine stresses that we could possibly imagine to be there. We store this stress information in a tensor, a three by three, or sometimes a two by two matrix, if we're only dealing with two parts of a coordinate system. 
And when we access individual elements of that tensor, we have this subscript notation. And remember, it's always faced first in that subscript convention. Now, because of rotational equilibrium, that tensor containing nine stresses actually decomposes to a tensor containing only six individual unknowns. This property of symmetry is therefore really useful and one that we will see exploited in quite some detail later on.